somebody recently asked me how much food you should can for a year. There's a booklet online that was printed back during World War II that answers that question for you. They have a chart that shows how much of each food you should can for a year. Uh, this is a great booklet and there's some other interesting things about canning in here, but I would not use their canning methods. Uh, I've read that back when they were doing this, they were encouraging everybody to grow and can as much food as they possibly could. And with the methods they were using for canning back then, they had about a 30% spoilage rate on the food that they put away. So do not use their methods. Uh, but here's uh, the recommendations for how much you would need to can for of each item. Uh, but I want to point out that for a lot of these items, it's for eight months. It's not for a year. Uh, they assume that you could eat fresh out of the garden four months out of the year. And I tell you, we have a long growing season here, and I would have a very hard time eating out of my garden for four months. So I, I would just increase these numbers by uh, half again, and then that would be your year's supply. But uh, there are uh, yearly amounts for one person. Uh, tomatoes, for example, it would be 30 to 40 quarts per person for eight months. And they also uh, let you know how much meat and poultry you would need. They also have in here how much sugar you would need for a year, how much milk, potatoes, fats. It's a very good book. And I have checked some of these numbers against uh, current food storage calculators, and they're pretty much the same. And this is what people were living by, so this is what I trust the most. And they have a few other things in here that I want to point out. I also want to point out this condition called flat sour because somebody recently asked me about this as it relates to corn. This is a condition that you can get in canning when food stays warm too long. And it can occur when you harvest your vegetables. If you pile them up too deeply, deeply then heat can build up and the spoilage can start occurring at that point. Then if you uh, canned up all of your vegetables and let them sit too long before you put them through the process, they could get flat sour at that point. And then after the canning process, if they take too long to cool, then they could develop flat sour. And when you're cooling your jars, you're supposed to let them cool at a normal pace, not not try to rush it, but not try to slow it down either. Uh, sometimes people will throw a towel or something over their jars and you should not do that because that interferes with the cooling process. And you should also not leave your jars in a canner overnight because they will stay too hot too long uh, by doing that as well. And flat sour can occur. It's not harmful to you, but it will spoil the food and make it so sour that you won't eat it. And it cannot be detected like most spoilage because uh, the it, gases do not form in the jars and it won't blow that lid off. That's why it's called flat sour because that lid will remain flat. So the information about that is in here and it's also in another booklet that was put out at that time that has a whole list of different canning problems that can occur and the descriptions and explanations on each one of those. So I'll put a link to that one in there as well. And be sure to see what they have to say about flat sour on that one. Here's a good chart that shows you how much food you would need in order to can a quart and how many pounds are in a bushel and how many quarts could be canned from a bushel. There's also an interesting section here when sugar is scarce because they were rationing sugar back in those days. So there's some hints and tips on that. There's instructions in here for making fruit pectin. This is something that I've wanted to try, but I haven't gotten around to it yet, is try to make some pectin out of orange peels. Next time I can some oranges, I'm gonna save those peels and give that a try. But I'm gonna use modern day instructions for it. I thought this was interesting too. They have tests for pectin. Sometimes when you're making jelly, depending on the fruit you use or how fresh it is or whatever, 
it can have a different pectin content of its own and it may or may not set with the amount of pectin that you've added into it. So they have a couple of tests here so that you can tell just how well it's going to set. One is using some alcohol and one is using some Epsom salts. You just mix that up and then depending on how well it gels with the alcohol or Epsom salts then you'll know how well it will set. I thought this was interesting too and I don't know how well you'll be able to see this but my mother-in-law who was a child during the depression said that this is the way that they stored uh, potatoes and sweet potatoes above ground where she lived they couldn't have root cellars which I can't have either because they'll flood but she said that they would put a piece of burlap on the ground they would pile the potatoes on top of that then they would cover it with another layer of burlap and then they cover it with soil and she said there would be an opening in the end that they could take the potatoes out of and they would keep all winter this way so there is a picture of it i had the hardest time imagining how that would look and sure enough there is a picture of it right here so if you need an above ground method of storing things like that then be sure to check on that and a man wrote me recently saying that he stores potatoes above ground he has a potato shed and it's built uh, it's in the shade and two sides of the shed are open and he said he has shelves in there uh, and they're made of the uh, tin, like tin roofing the ripple type stuff and he did, they just set the potatoes on top of those uh, rippled pieces of uh, metal and they keep in there like that because they're getting good airflow around them and I stored my sweet potatoes this year in some uh, flats like you start uh, seedlings in and they're rippled in the bottom for drainage but purely by accident I kept them in those and apparently there is something to that airflow because they kept better this year than any I've ever kept. So that's another way that you could store things like potatoes in an above ground situation so that they wouldn't flood. And he said that they also dusted theirs with uh, lime to keep the bugs off of it. Here's the other booklet that I was talking about that tells about the prevention of spoilage and the signs of it and a lot of this they describe the spoilage and they say that it's okay to go ahead and eat it but I wouldn't do it <laughs> but it would be a good reference if you had some spoilage occur or problems with your canning then you could uh, find out you know what might have caused it so that you won't do that again but you see that the uh, flat sour uh, comes up quite often in here. They, it was a problem with tomatoes. I uh, know it's a problem with corn and peas as well. But this is a, a nice little chart to read through the different problems. Um, you know, just reading it and you could avoid a lot of problems. You don't have to wait till it spoils. So there's a couple of good resources for you. When it comes to the flat sour, a lot of the information that I've read about it, they warn not to keep the food too warm for too long. And my question was, well, how long is too long? And I did a lot of digging to find that answer. And the answer is three hours. You want to keep it under three. And when it comes to how much to can per year, I would use these numbers at a minimum because you can easily run into a bad gardening year. I'm facing two years in a row of bad gardening years. So I always just can everything I can and uh, it, it lasts for more than a year. So there's some information for you. I hope it helps.